numbers. Notorious for his intercession, he said, write something. And I said, I don't know what to write for. And he says, write to be healed of dyslexia. And I said, how do you spell dyslexia? <laughs> and Father Basil said, don't worry about it. He'll know. So I wrote down to be healed of dyslexia. And it, w it was taken up and put under his, the relic of his skull, which is in a bishop's crown. And uh, my dyslexia disappeared. And it was particularly uh, important for my future because I was so bad if I was either tired or stressed out my dyslexia came out in a big way. And uh, so, for instance, one time I caused a great uh, amount of chuckle during a, when I did a, um, the little hours in, in a monastery, St. Tikhon's. I was visiting St. Tikhon's for 14 days, and, and I said, and I asked God to, I, I, I changed the word transgressions to transmissions. And sometimes I would reverse sentences. And, uh, and, the, and if there was anybody like a bishop present, I, would, I couldn't even do it because I was so nervous and the, the dyslexia would get even worse. So there was no possibility that I would ever be ordained. The hieromonk, just no possibility at all. So I had already resigned to the fact that I would never be a hieromonk. But St. Nectarius decided that I should be, and, and this is what happened. When I was in, I taught a high school at an all-boys high school in Berkeley, California, St. Mary's College High School. And every year, we would have the seniors play volleyball against the faculty. And every year the faculty lost big time. Except the year that was my last year there. And I told the faculty members, I said, before we start this game, we're going to run the loop in the gym with our thumbs up and we're going to win. And we did. And the freshmen, the sophomores, and the juniors all leapt to their feet yelling for us when we won. And when I went to college, my first year of college, because it was a different type of system, even though I had dyslexia, all of a sudden I went from barely a C to straight A's. And it ended up getting me in graduate school. And, but I look back at all of this. And, and I also took up running and weightlifting. I was, a, I was so good at weightlifting that I was actually teaching weightlifting in a Y. I share all of this because On my journey here, and I watched that documentary on Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Rogers said that his tender care of children would not have been, ha have been possible if he hadn't been a little fat kid, because he was really fat when he was a little boy, and all the kids made fun of him. And I look back at the rough life I had as growing up. I had wonderful parents, but I'll give you an example of how bad it could get. My dad was a golf pro, and on, in the summertime, there was uh, Women's Day was Thursdays, and the women would all come and play golf together, and 
and the club was open to just women. And my mother was a fabulous cook, and my mother ran the kitchen for, for Women's Day. And so she would put out a beautiful dinner, and then she would, and, and my first job at 14 was waiting tables in that cafe there, the restaurant at the country club. And I was very proud of it. And, uh, and I remember to this day, there was one table with seven women sitting around it, and I was pouring their coffee after I'd given them their dessert. And one of the women looked up at me, and she said, David, how is it that your dad is so handsome, and your mother is so beautiful, and they were, and you've turned out so homely? I was 14. And I remember to this day turning beet red and hightailing it into the kitchen. And my mother said, what happened? And I wouldn't tell her. I didn't tell her till she was in a rest home. And I finally one day told her, I said, by the way, Mom, you should know this. She said, I would have busted him. And the worst part of it was that the woman that said that said it in front of all these other women, and not one of them followed me into the kitchen to say that's not true, which meant they all agreed that I was homely. When I was teaching college and high school, let me tell you, I watched for the bullies. They didn't stand a chance in my class. And after I had sort of grown into my body and became an athlete late in college, I still remembered all of that. I still to this day remember that. And I give thanks to God for that experience because I know that I would not have a compassionate heart for the underdog if I hadn't been an underdog. I was an under puppy. And so I personally experienced the cruelty that people can inflict on other people. And it's one of the reasons why in college I became a political activist because I was so fed up with what our society, what we were doing as a people to each other. I, I still am fed up with that, but in a different way. The different way is that I recognize that everyone, like this little boy that I was, needs love. And they need every one of us needs to be affirmed by others. And every one of us needs to be vigilant that if we see someone else being picked on because of their race or their gender or whatever it would be, we need to stand with them. So I give thanks for that experience. I still, I still have some of that um, from a different perspective now, being in the church and what we sometimes tend to do to our own. But it's a tragic thing that has no place in the life of the church, and yet it's there a lot. A number of years ago, I spoke in the Archdiocese of, uh, of Archbishop Mark of the OCA in uh, eastern Pennsylvania. And while I was there, I heard a story that has haunted me, a true story. 
in one of his parishes, there was a, a black woman came in to check it out. She came into the divine liturgy. And a woman walked up to her and she said, why are you here? We don't allow junkies. There's a church up the street for you. And when Archbishop Mark found out about it, he paid an archpastoral visit to that church. I wish I had been there with him. And he stood in front of the entire congregation and he said, one of you in this church did this to that woman, who, by the way, burst into tears and fled. I don't need to know who you are. I don't even want to know. But I'm telling you that as your bishop, I am giving you a penance for the rest of your life to pray for the salvation of that woman. And no one can lift this penance but me. And I'm not going to lift it. We need more hierarchs like that. We need more priests like that. And we as a people need to be together. It's not right when we see someone suffering abuse of any sort. I was in Berkeley one time a few years ago driving up um, Shattuck Avenue and I, I saw a man abusing a woman on a street corner. He was kind of shaking her, and he slapped her. And I looked around as I'm driving towards them, and everybody's just driving by. And I, uh, I went into my police chaplain mode, and I drove up on the curb, and I got out, and I said, back off. Leave that woman alone. This guy was a lot bigger than I. I had more girth, but he was bigger than I. And he turned on me with his fist, ready to come at me. And I reached into my pocket and I pulled out my sheriff's badge. <laughs> and I held it up. And I, I lied. I said, I've already called the police. They're on their way. I hadn't. I hadn't had time. But I held up the badge and I said, can you imagine what they're going to do to you? that you're not only beating up an old priest in robes, but he happens to be a police chaplain? I said, life as you know it is going to end today if you don't back off, walk away from this woman, and leave us both alone. And uh, he did. He walked away. I got in my car and drove to my Capuchin Franciscans and said, I need a beer. <laughs> but our, our world, our society would be a whole lot better if, if none of us ever allowed ourselves to put blinders on. I don't see it. I don't know it's happening. Because that's all, all that is is denial. It's not only denying what's happening to another human being, but it is throwing our personal responsibility out the window. And I really believe that when we stand before the throne of God, we're not going to be asked, did you make the sign of the cross properly and dramatically enough? And did you have the proper bow? Were you in all the liturgical services? Did you do everything by the book? Were you orthodox enough? What we are going to be asked is how we have loved God and our neighbor. That's what we're going to be asked. 
and many sins will be forgiven by our being activists in the Christian sense changing lives by interacting in a positive way with those that we, from whom we come in contact. To you priests, by the way, I had somebody come up to me during the break and said, thank you for talking to priests about things too. Well, we need to. We, we priests need to be talked to. I told my archbishop once, I said the trouble with most, I didn't say most, I said the trouble with many of your priests is that they are no more than wizards. They dress the part, they use the proper wizardry language, in this case Church Slavonic. Their services are uncut. Everything is there that could be there, never mind at high speed. All the exterior traditions of orthodoxy they keep strictly. But I said they don't know how to preach. They don't know how to love. It's all about kiss my hand. That is a giant mistake for we priests. You know that old saying of the Desert Fathers that the, that, uh, the road to hell is paved with the skulls of priests and bishops. We have to take that seriously. But we also have to take that seriously as the people of God. Who among us would not defend our little sister, even as a child, if she was being mocked or pushed in the playground? And yet we allow the women in our lives, or even our neighbors, to be abused and mocked in a sexual way. We allow people who are poor to be treated like trash. I was in a restaurant in San Jose many years ago and a homeless person came in, had been collecting money out front and he came in to have lunch. And the waitress came up and said, you can't come in here. And he says, but I have money. You can't come in here. And I got out of my booth and I walked up and I gave him a hug and I said, he's with me. And, and I had him sit in my booth. She backed off. I was dressed properly. A number of years ago, I had been, I have, whoopee, I get $400 a month Social Security. <laughs> I didn't put much into it because I became a monk 40 years ago. But I get that $400, $420 a month that goes into my account, my private account. Now, most monks would have to give that into the general fund, but I'm the abbot. So it goes into the abbatial fund. And initially, a doctor friend of mine who's Norwegian had said, Father, if you raise, if you can save $3,000, I will take you to Norway. So I had been... I have a book, a special book. It's called A World Atlas, and it's empty, and it has a little code on the back. And So I've been putting that money in there, in a secret place in my office. I guess I could tell you it's in my, my grandmother's uh, uh, 
secretary. But I'll be watching you if you come to visit. <laughs> so I, the money was going up and up. And one day I said to Dr. Vaca, and I said, I've got $3,000. And he said, well, let's start planning the trip. And I said, well, I'm not really ready yet. So it kept going up and up. And one day I thought, you know, what a selfish thing to be doing. I don't need to go to, I can look at YouTube videos of Norway. I don't need to go to Norway. So I prayed to God, what do I do with this money? And it came to me. I was in uh, a procession, a line for a procession of, of fire chaplains, uh, of the National Fire Chaplains, uh, International let's see, Federation of Fire Chaplains was having a convention in Seattle. And there was going to be a big procession at St. James Catholic Cathedral with bagpipes and all that. So we were all assembled outside, and everybody was in their uniforms, and I was in mine. And a homeless man came down the street, and he came right to me and asked if I could spare some money. And don't you think that the other chaplains didn't notice that he bypassed them and came to me? And one of the chaplains said, Father Trifon, aren't you concerned that this man will use the money on booze or drugs? And I said, no, I'm not concerned. He's, he's worthy of my charity and my love. And so if he does abuse that by spending it on the wrong thing, that's with him. But, but I'm standing before God. So it was at that time I knew what I was going to do with the money. So it's been maybe three years now that I have a, uh, I do this. Whenever I'm going to be off island, I take a 20, a 10, a 5, and a 1. And I mix them all up. I can't see where they are. And I put them in my pocket. And it is, therefore, up to God what they're going to get when they spare change me. No, I'm guilt-free. I'm not contributing God is. And uh, I told you yesterday about uh, when I was speaking at the uh, Armenian Holocaust Memorial in downtown Seattle a few years ago. But one thing that happened at the end when these guys were all walking me to my car and they had the banner, the, the, the uh, Armenian flag, and I got to my car and I put my Klobuk and Ross in the car and I turned around and all these young people were reaching out to get a blessing. And there was an old homeless guy leaning against the building. And he saw these guys, these young people putting their hands out. And he thought, this guy's giving out money. So he got up and he politely kind of meandered through these other young people. And he put his hand out and he said, do you have any money for me? And I reached into my pocket to see what God had for him. And out came the 20. And I handed it to him. And something amazing happened that I will never forget. He took the $20 bill he extended it out like this towards me. And he said, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? That man thought I had made a mistake. It was obvious at that moment that he thought I meant to give him a $1 bill. And he felt so unworthy that he was giving me an opportunity to take the 20 back and give him a one. And I said, of course I'm sure. I want you to get something good to eat, to quote 
Bishop Mark of Blessed Memory. And as the man turned, he was holding it, looking down, and he said quietly to himself, Now I can. There's a guy on Vashon Island. He's a homeless man. He lives in a forest. And uh, his name is Jake. He is filthy. He never bathes. And he's always leaning against the wall in front of our drugstore. And he has a problem with alcohol and drugs. And everybody knows it. And one day there's a crosswalk that's right in front of our one street little gathering, our little, uh, and it goes from a, a, a little cafe directly across the street to the drugstore. And I'm coming down the street in my car. And I see that he's starting to make to, to cross the street. So I stopped. And he looked at me, and he went like this, but with the middle finger. And I'm thinking, where's this come from? A week later, there was a young man... 25 years old, who shot his head off with a pistol, committed suicide. And I was called by the sheriff's department. And I arrived, and his mother and his father were there, and they were sobbing and couldn't be consoled. And they're my friends to this day, these people. And so I helped try to walk them through. There was no suicide note. Their son seemed happy. He had a wonderful girlfriend. He had a great job. And all of the other young people on the island adored him. And he was kind of the leader. And no one to this day understands what happened and why he did this. So I'm going into the drugstore. I paid their... I, I pay their salaries, by the way, <laughs> being my age and all. And I'm going into the drugstore, and, and, and Jake is sitting there. And this is a week after he had given me the finger. And I looked down at him, and I said, I didn't know his name at the time, and I said, how are you doing? And he said, not good. One of my friends committed suicide. It should have been me. And I said, no. It shouldn't have been him, RJ, and it shouldn't have been you. And God loves you. <coughs> and he started to cry. So later that day, I stopped in to visit with RJ's parents to see how they were doing. And I told them about Jake and what he had said. And Raul, who was Jake's, uh, uh, who was uh, the, the son or the father of the son that committed suicide, said, Oh, our son really loved him. And whenever he was really down and out and needed to sell his guitar, our son would buy his guitar from him. And when he had the money, he'd give it back to him. So there was no chance that it would be lost, you know, in one of those, uh, what do you call the places? <laughs> Pawn shop. And, and then he said, RJ would want him to have his guitar back. We have it. Would you come with me? And I said, sure. So we went to see this young man. He was about probably 28. And we walked up to him, and he's leaning against the building as usual. And Raul handed him the guitar. 
He said, R.J. would want you to have this. And the poor young man burst into tears again. And then I said, but there's a, a, a hitch on this. I said, you, um, a hook, or whatever the word would be. I said, whenever you see me, I want you to play me a tune. The guy was a composer. And to this day now, if he happens to have his guitar, it's back and forth between somebody else now. But if he's got that guitar, I always stop and I, said, and I say, play me a tune. And he does. This is what Jesus wants me to be. My boss. My Lord and my Savior wants me to do that. He wants all of us to do that. For those who would object to that kind of behavior, we need only look at the relationship that Jesus had with the Pharisees. It's not like what the Pharisees were doing were wrong. It was the motives behind it and the pride and the arrogance. And what did Jesus do? He ate with tax collectors and hung out with sinners like the woman at the well. That's what Jesus wants us to do. And there are so many opportunities. There are myriad. I was in Tacoma early one morning. I'd been called by the sheriff's department because of a deputy that had been shot. And uh, so in the early hours of the morning, I went to a little breakfast cafe. And I'm sitting there, and there's hardly anybody in there, but there's an elderly woman sitting at a table, and she's eating her, her breakfast. And, and I looked at her, and she looked so lonely. And I immediately thought of my grandma. By the way, my Grandma Harrelson's name was Mabel. But as a young woman, she changed it to Dolores. And she gave her daughter, her firstborn daughter, the name Dolores. So here's my Norwegian mother with his Spanish name, Dolores. And we could never understand why Grandma Harrelson took the name Dolores until one day we found out that she took the name uh, from some singer, dancer uh, uh, of the... 30s, I think it was. So she became Dolores. And uh, so I'm looking at this woman and I'm thinking, like this is my, my grandma. And so when they brought me my bill, I said, I want you to put her bill on mine. And so as I, I paid the bill for both of us, and as I'm leaving the restaurant, I went over to this table and I looked down at that woman and I said, I bought you breakfast. And she looked up and she said, you did? And I said, yes. I said, this morning you are my grandma. And I love you and I want you to have breakfast on me. And she started to cry. And I had another occasion when I was up in Buckley, which is near Mount Rainier. And uh, same thing, I went into a restaurant for breakfast and there was an elderly woman who was sitting in the booth opposite mine and she was facing me and she had a, a pauper's breakfast. It, didn't, it wasn't much at all. And, and I... I looked at that and I thought, that, I bet you that woman doesn't have much money and I bet she's very lonely. 
And every time the waitress would come to pour more coffee for her, you, would see, you could see this old woman trying to engage the waitress in conversation, but the waitress didn't have time for her. So here was this woman going deeper into this, into this loneliness, this terrible loneliness. So when I was leaving, I paid, uh, when the waitress came over and I paid the bill for both of us, and meanwhile the old woman called for her bill and the waitress said, oh, he paid your, your bill. And she looked at me and she said, you did? And on her way out of the restaurant, she turned towards everyone in the restaurant and she said, I'm 86 and no one has ever bought me breakfast until today and this has made my day I would much rather spend my money like that from my abatial fund than go to Norway When I stand before the throne of God, I'm not going to be asked, well, how did you like Norway? <laughs> That's disappointing for some Norwegians to hear that. But uh, So, you know, this is making our Orthodox faith alive and well. And it's also building on community. I, uh, one day, Father Moses, or Father um, Martin, who's our cook, we had had lots of visitors for days, and Father Martin had been doing all this wonderful cooking, and I finally said one day, to, I said, how would you like it if the old abbot took everybody out for pizza today? And he says, oh, that would be wonderful. So we went to a place called The Rock, which is a pizza parlor on the island. And they have good beer and good pizza. So we went there and we had two big pizzas. And, and while we were there, there was an elderly woman. There was a couple um, with an elderly woman sitting with them at another table. And this old woman kept staring at me. And I thought, why is she staring at me? And finally, she came up to me and she said, Father Trayvon, I want to thank you that that day that my husband died and on Vashon Island uh, the first ferry uh, is after four in the morning and so if you're if you have a death on the island uh, the medical examiner cannot come to the island until the first ferry which means that a body of a deceased person whether they're suicide or death by natural causes has to stay there. And so I'm called by the fire department medics and they said this man has died of a heart attack. We couldn't, we couldn't bring him to and we need you. So I drove down there and it was a remote part of the island down a long dirt road on the West End Beach. And there's this cute little house sitting there. And I walked in and the sheriff's department personnel and the medics were all waiting for me to get there so they could get on to their, their jobs. And I walked in and here's this woman. They had been married for 63 years. And they were having a nice evening when her husband just fell over in the living room, dead. And you could imagine how she felt. And so I, I noticed a bottle of wine with the cork out. And I said, why don't we sit here in the kitchen and have a glass of wine together? I want you to tell me all about your life with your husband. Tell me about it. So that was about 2.30 in the morning, and I had to be there until around 5.00. She had her daughter and son-in-law 
on their, on their way uh, and the medical examiner to take the body. So her husband was lying on the sofa with a white sheet over him, and we sat there. And she recounted how they met and, and their life together, and when they first moved to Vashon Island and when they first decided they wanted to live on the beach. And so meanwhile, I'm in the Rock Pizza, and this woman finally comes over and she said, you probably don't remember me, but... And immediately I remembered her because she was up close and I heard her voice and I said, yes, I remember you. And she said, I want you to know how much it meant to me to have you there and urging me to talk about my husband. She said, it got me through it. Where's the young woman that was saying that she might want to be a chaplain? Do it. All my assistant chaplains on Vashon are women, by the way. Can't get those guys off their butts. <laughs> but think about how you would feel if you lost your spouse and you had no friends or family coming to your aid at that moment. You need someone. And we all have, we're all neighbors to somebody. Be available. I remember an old guy who, uh, in his age, in his old age, he was just, didn't have the energy to go out and mow his lawn. And he got a notice in the mail from the city of Seattle telling him that he was in violation, he had, to, he had to keep that lawn mowed. And I read this in the paper, this isn't somebody I knew, but a neighbor found out about it. And the neighbor's 14-year-old boy who mowed their lawn started mowing his lawn. Same back and forth, mowing both lawns. And he wouldn't take any money for it. And then, because of that act of charity, mowing the old man's lawn, his parents, and it was his idea, his parents started paying attention to the old guy. And so his mom would bring over, she'd bake two pies instead of one, bring the old man one of those. And for Thanksgiving and Christmas, they started having the old man over to dinner. It was life-giving. And you know what I think of when I, when I hear stories like that? I think of the Good Samaritan when the priest is passing by the man that's been mugged and robbed and left in the ditch. And the Good Samaritan, the outcast, stops and not only takes care of him and dresses his wounds, but he puts him on his own mule and he takes him to a, I don't know what they did call them hostels, but whatever. And he takes him there and he pays the proprietor of this place, take care of this man and when I come back through, I will, I will give you what the cost has been. And of course, that was one of Jesus' parables. And it's a message for all of us to be like the, like the Good Samaritan to everyone that we come in contact with. And in turn, what happens is that our own heart is warmed. I can tell you that uh, I don't like long services. I certainly don't like them when they're in a language I don't understand. (laughs) 
and getting close, three minutes. And uh, so when I experience those services, and I'm, if I'm at the least bit tired, and at my age I'm tired a lot, I just want to... I want to go across the street from our cathedral and, and have a cup of coffee and, and, and engage people in conversation. And uh, But, so in, in other words, I'm telling you I am not a very good monk. A good monk would love the long services. The longer they are, the better. That's, that's not me. When I met um, Abbess Markella, who's known as a clairvoyant, she's the abbess of this monastery of the Life-Giving Spring in Dunlap, California, and she's a holy woman, has a reputation far and wide. And when I was giving a, uh, a conference uh, at the Orthodox Christian Fellowships conference there, and I was going to meet this woman, and I thought, oh, no, I oh, know. She's going to see right through me. She's going, oh, my God, this guy's a bad monk. <laughs> and you know what she did instead? Oh, Father Trifon, t- three of my nuns are here because of you. And I said, what? When they were little girls... The Greek summer camp took a school bus out to visit your monastery and you did your Athenite beard trick for them. (laughs) I can't do it anymore. My beard isn't like it used to be. But I used to put my beard up here. I put this hat on. You couldn't see my face and I put on dark round sunglasses. (laughs) And that was my Athenite beard trick. And there was a priest locally that saw me do that, and he said, Father Trifon, no one will take you seriously if you do that again. <laughs> but the kids were more important to me than what this guy thought or most everybody else, I guess. And so, unbeknownst to me, three of those little girls on that school bus became nuns, and they told the abbess that their first experience with monasticism was Abba Trifon's beard trick. <laughs> and best of all, this clairvoyant woman told me that, are you ready for this? In front of the priest and his wife who had condemned me for it. They happened to be there. Now, how wonderful was that? That's like a... <laughs> all right. Have I told you lately that I love you? I better get out of here.